There wasn't much to look at. She faced a faded blue wall with no windows. Mounted on it was a portrait framed by a set of candle-filled shelves. Her son tried to smuggle the candles out during his visits. She knew every time he looked at them, he saw his inheritance going up in flames. Virginia sat in the blue wing-back chair that had once belonged to her grandfather. It took years to remold its compact stuffing to her body, but eventually the chair conformed. Every night after dinner, she settled there in that chair, in the alcove at the end of the hall. Not that she would have minded dying there in a blaze or peacefully. This is where she always wanted to be. But tonight, no candles burned. She sat alone in the dark, her eyes tracing the lines her vision obscured. The voice she pretended was his whispered in her mind. That's what made the weight bearable. The sun had set hours ago. According to the Celtic calendar, a new day had begun. Today was Beltine, a time when fairies ran amok. Sure, she was miles from the Emerald Isles of Ireland, or the moors and hills of Scotland, snuggled nice and safe in a northwestern Ohio, but she figured magic was everywhere and she needed only to believe. If her son knew what she was doing, he would have had her committed. Every sound caused her hopes to rise. Clinking of glasses, the house settling, the branches tapping on the window. Any of them could have been a fairy. All two had to do was fall into her traps. They were placed throughout the house. Some were as simple as baited mouse traps. Those were created in the premise that fairies were idiots. But a few were ingenious, just in case. Each was baited with whatever dairy products had been in the fridge. Tomorrow the place was going to reek, but it was worth it. She'd hidden all the iron objects of her house. Every bell she owned was either in pieces or stuffed. She trimmed away any primroses, hawthorn, and any other anti-fairy plants from her gardens. This place should have been a magnet for them. The weight was a terrible thing. She had expected a bite, if not two by now. Yes, she reminded herself, it has to be two. A clattering by her front door drove her into action. Living in a place all your life and never changing the furniture had its benefits. As she entered the foyer, she could have sworn something floated in the air beside the yellow lace curtains, but she blinked and it was gone. That didn't matter. Something made some noise inside the old butter churn her mother had used when she was a child. It screeched, squeaked, scratched. It couldn't get out. Her trap had worked. Sure, it sounded as if it was some rodent, but that was all a ruse. Virginia was certain of it. She flexed her cold, stiffened hands a few times. By now she knew it was useless damning her arthritis. Instead of carrying it, she just rolled it and the fairy, battering the old walls of her home, back to the portrait's alcove. With one caught, she thought it would act as a lure for others. It was safe once again to light up the room, light up his face. Her aching hands fumbled with the matches, and she burned her fingers more than once. It was worth it. When he came into view, she smiled. Sure, at first glance, he looked brooding and foreboding. Virginia blamed the artist for that. He had painted the subject mostly in shadow. Then again, his choice of clothing, a conservative old-fashioned suit, and lackluster background didn't help the matter. He hadn't changed since the day they met 64 years ago. Virginia and her family had moved in to take care of her ill grandfather. They moved in in an attempt to suck up and get a bigger inheritance. She had been a child of eight, hunting for treasures in the attic. What she found was it, him, the only completed piece in a pile of half-finished paintings. As she brought him down the stairs, she had ripped her dress. Her mother gave her hell for that. That was only a slight blemish on what she currently considered the happiest day of her life. The fairy began screeching in a higher pitch and wildly thrashing about inside the churn. Ignore it, my love. It's only a means to an end, she whispered. The chilly May air made her throat go dry. So did his eyes. Hers lingered on his for a moment too long. His eyes were what attracted her most to the painting. He tried to hide it, standing prim and proper, not a hint of a smile. The artist saw through all that. In her love's eyes there was fear. Fear what she always wondered. But his eyes, that's what made him real, human to her. A scratching sound drew her back to the churn. Out the top, where the hole stuck out, was a tiny hand. Its fingers were as thin as sewing needles, and their tips just as sharp. Done pretending to be a mouse, eh? The victory brought a smile to her face. A ghost of a voice, distant and hollow, came from the churn. What do you want of me, hag? 
to be with the love of my life, she said as her finger traced the slightly askew tie, whatever his name is. Sounds of confusion and annoyance radiated from the churn. How was she supposed to explain it? No one, including her grandfather, knew who the man was. He was a mystery. From her childhood, she had begun building him up in her mind, answering the questions that surrounded him with her imagination and accepting them as fact. His voice took the longest to form. She was eleven when she first heard it. One day, while staring at him, he whispered to her, Hello, my sweet. His voice was cordial yet seductive. Finally, all the fairy tale princes had found a voice to match their faces, his. As she grew older and sinful thoughts entered her developing mind, whenever she went to confession and uttered the words, I had a dream, she meant him. Through the darkness, it seemed his lusty hand always found its way up her skirt. Every man, her two husbands included, were measured against him and found wanting. He was perfect, though she knew nothing about him. A glance at the clock revealed it was four in the morning. Where had the time gone? Her son Derek was going to visit at seven. She could see his greedy little face upon finding the house like this. Social services and attorneys were probably on his speed dial waiting for the signal. If I offered you freedom in exchange for two others of your kind, fairy, would you obey? She wondered if the creature could smell her desperation. Wheezing, hollow laughter left the churn. I would rather die than enslave two of my kin. Exactly what she expected. It was her luck to get a noble one. Well then, Virginia sat wearily back in her chair. Up until now she had refused failure, even a partial one, to enter her mind. But her options were becoming limited. What would she ask for in return for the fairy's freedom? Initially, she wanted a night with the beauty and health of her youth, a night with him. Bringing him here, with her like this? No, that was out of the question. He deserved better. And at the thing was being contrary, so she ignored it. Her eyes trailed over his roguish mane. Perhaps it would be enough to hear his voice just one time. Maybe just hearing him say her name would be fulfillment enough. Asking to have her youth again for just one night, that would be pointless without him. Tell me, do fairies love, she found herself asking the churn. Again came that unnatural laughter. No. That was a lie. She would want to hear the sweet nothings and the declarations her dreams were filled with. On second thought, that was a dangerous request. Up until that moment, she had a voice for him, and what if it didn't live up to the sultry whispers? What if it sounded like that greaseball Ernie, the best man at her first wedding? His name. Perhaps it was time to learn it. It would be her dying words, shrouding her love in eternal mystery. She had often wondered if it reflected the strength of his jaw. It could have been embodied by the sophisticated air of his goatee. Maybe. There were so many maybes. Bob included. No, Bob could never do. Her mind spun. The truth of her situation hit her. In the end, what if she had caught two fairies? All her romantic thoughts, every belief she had ever held, could have been shattered. This night could have destroyed everything she had ever believed in. Her definition of true love would be nothing but lies embedded in her memory. Virginia reached down and popped the churn lid off. Go. The sunken face of the fairy curved into a pointy smile. What, nothing? Lovingly, she reached out and touched the painted cheek of her two-dimensional lover. I'm an old woman, set in my ways. I'd rather die full of fantasies than die broken and disappointed. The fairy hadn't cared. It disappeared before she even finished her first sentence.